Guys, welcome to Groovy Puzzlers. I believe it's the first time done. Um, if you drop into the command line shell, you type in who am I, you see my name is Noam. I've uh, been developing on JVM for quite a while, dating Groovy also for pretty much a long time. Um, I'm the maintainer of the Grails REST plugin and also the Elasticsearch plugin, and I've also initiated the SGVM. Right now I work for JFrog, and I'm the lead developer on Bintray.com. If you haven't heard of us, uh, basically we're the guys behind the Artifactory Binary Repository Manager and Bintray, which is the social platform for distributing binaries. So, Groovy Puzzlers. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the Java Puzzlers. Okay, that's a good number. This is good. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with Java Puzzlers, it was sort of a concept started by Josh Block and Neil Gafter, well, way back. Um, and they've kind of started doing this game show at conferences and also even published a book where they basically showed some pieces of Java code on the screen and asked the participants to guess what would be the output or the behavior of the code. And this is just the same idea but with Groovy. It's a small game show. I will show you pieces of Groovy code. I will show you the options for uh, output or behavior, and you'll try to guess as best as you can. So if you're familiar with the Java puzzlers, they were pretty long, they were pretty tedious. Some of them were like two or three pages and slides long. This is not the same. They are all short. Uh, they are all very, very clear in, in my idea. Some would have been solved if I would have read the manual. Some would have been uh, solved if I hadn't uh, programmed such ugly, groovy code. Some are really tricky, and some are just simple, straightforward, no tricks at all, just to make sure you're on your toes. Nonetheless, they're all fun. I promise you that. So, first rule of groovy puzzlers is no cheating. No using the groovy shell. No using the groovy web console. No IDs. Just use this. Okay? Now, I mean business, because if any of you are caught cheating, the penalty is high. This means you will be uh, forced to use the Groovy HTTP builder for a whole year with no documentation or sources. <laughs> Serious business, guys. It's no laughing matter, okay? So, think long and hard. Before we start, any questions? Are we good to go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no cheating, yeah. No talking about cheating either. So. Okay, so we'll start off, we'll take it easy, uh, it'll get harder and harder, and I really hope you'll have fun, as much fun as I've had uh, making these puzzles. So, first off, absolutely groovy. Tonight we will have beers, not vodka, but I'm sure it's much better than absolute because the good guys are great con for brewed it. Very straightforward. The integer class, actually all the number classes of groovy, have a very nice absolute method, which saves you from using math.absolute. Um, if I take this code and paste it into the console, which you're not allowed to do, okay? What would be the output? Three. So these are the options. Some say three. Who says A? Raise your hands. That's three. Okay, good. B? No one. Great. C? Minus three. Okay. And D? Good. Minus three is the correct answer. Why is that? So, if you've been to Mr. Hackey's excellent session, uh, you'd know that basically the minus operator is basically like invoking uh, unary minus, okay, which will be called last. So the execution is actually three point absolute, then minus, which will result in minus three. We could have avoided it if we'd use, actually this is a really good place to plug my dirty clean code opinions, but if we would have used variables, for example, and no magic numbers, this would have been clear and also solved. So, we're all quick learners, we're good guys. Um, 
we've surrounded our code with parentheses. But now we want to display this. What will be the result? These are your options. Choose wisely. So, will it still print minus three? Will it taunt us? Will it print a three and begrudgingly throw an exception? Just, you know, find dirty. Hands up if you think it's A. A few. B, anyone for B? Very good. C, okay. And D, nice. So, if you chose D, you were correct. Uh, like I said, it fights dirty, it will go down and it'll take you with it. It happened because we hate parentheses and we got to use to really good life and uh, we shouldn't forget them, okay? Uh, the parentheses actually have played a crucial role here where they were actually claimed by the print and end method. So basically our code, as we asked it to do, printed minus three, then try to invoke the absolute method on the return value of print and end, which is void. So don't forget those parentheses. Once again, clean code, guys. Don't forget it. <laughs> okay. So next is out of range. I think this is an RPMs, not the RPM packages, I hope. Uh, but let's see. Okay, so I've declared here a new range. Take note, it's the decimal range, okay? From 1.0 to 10.0. First, I assert that the range contains 5.0. Then I print the result of uh, whether the collection contains 5.6 or not. So, what do you think, guys? When I get an assertion of failure, because, I don't know, it's weird, isn't it? Will it print false? Who votes false? Okay, who votes true? It's a range, it's a decimal range, no? People have little faith. Null pointer exception? Okay. So, you were correct if you chose B. And you chose B, and you were right, because of Java compatibility. We like those guys, the Java guys. Most of us, I think, came from there. Uh, most of us still write Java. And basically, when we declare a range from 1.0, it's equal, almost equal, well, to a list containing the numbers of 1 to 10. And invoking the contains will actually invoke the standard collection contains method. So. Obviously, if I'd invoke it with 5.6, it'd say, no, I do not contain 5.6 because I just have ordinary numbers. I am not a range, you weirdo. Um, so, uh, you're not lost, though. You still can check the range, and you've got this really beautiful method, I love it, contains within bounds. And it'll do what well, you meant to do with contains. You can check for the decimal version, which contains in the list, and you can also check for the decimal version, which is part of the range. Also good for dates. Uh, not just uh, decimal or whatever. Sorry. Yes. So does that work if there's just an integer range, one to ten? Can you still check if five point six is within bounds? I am not sure. It makes sense, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm allowed to drive it on the console. You're not. Okay. I've got another computer here. It's okay. Right, the groovy treasure map. Okay, we're all pirates. We love pirates. Pirates love treasure. So let's get some sweet, sweet treasure. I've declared a key, which is X. X marks a spot, which will take me to the treasure. I've created a map, put in the key, and I've got the way to the treasure. Then I try to retrieve the treasure using my key. What will be the result? What will print? No such element exception. Okay, null, unfound. Who says a treasure will be found? Who has faith? What about the BSOD? You might have noticed that I'm running Linux, but this code is so horrendous. It might throw a BSOD, you never know. Tried running Griffin last night and I got a core dump, so. <laughs> yeah, it's my fault for using Java and Linux. I'll ask for it. 
Okay, that's right, null is the result. Null is the result because keys are taken literally, even though in the same method and the same scope you have a variable or a sort of parameter with the same name, we ignore it. Uh, I think rightfully so. Uh, but we literally take the keys, so we'll only get our treasure if we do get on the key itself. If we want to use a variable for a key, we can still do it, but we have to take uh, a different route. So you can use the maps standard uh, API for put, you can use the field accessor method, or the nice square brackets. These all work, these are all fine, it does the job well done. I do not. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Cheers. No, really, thank you. I did not know that. But good to go. <laughs> okay. So, building on this route to the treasure, this time I use a number. Ah, number. We know keys are taken literally. I'm doing it right this time, aren't I? I was close to a kernel panic yesterday, but nothing to do with that. Um, so, what do you say? Will I get back null? An null treasure, a missing treasure. By the way, no looking at what Guillaume, Cedric, and Jochen are answering. That's not allowed either. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> you should have sat at the back. <laughs> B, missing, missing property. Okay. C, treasure. Will I get my treasure finally? No. Kernel panic. I mean, why do I still do it? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So now is the correct answer once more because Keys are taken literally excluding numbers. So, my keys still must be a number, except the square brackets. Except the square brackets, yeah. Yeah, but I hadn't had the chance to fix in between the last slide now, so. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, thanks for the input. It's really important because, you know, we'll speak later. Um, yeah, that was nice. Saving a date. I was looking at this picture, and I was thinking what happened if Google would have brought Lego? And would, would it be called Google Lego? Oh, it's kind of weird. weird musings, never mind. Google Lego. <laughs> Google brand Lego. Okay, I think this is a really cool picture. This is still keeping it simple, okay? I've still got like nice hard stuff here, so don't get all arrogant and you know if you know the answer. So I've got a list of integers this time. No more maps. We're done with maps for now. Uh, I'm sure you're all sick of maps. And now I try to insert a date into my list of integers. And I print the list. Perhaps it won't be, com be compiled at all. Perhaps it will fail in compilation. Will it print the two string of the date? Will it print the uh, epoch value of the date? Or maybe class cast exception, because I'm trying to insert a date into a list of integers. What do you say, guys? A, won't compile. That's good, because Groovy always compiles. That's nice. <laughs> How about B? B to string, good. A wise, uh, wise bunch of folks. Current time value, the epoch. It's a list of integers and numbers. Why not the epoch? Class cast exception, because it's a date and a list of uh, integers. Okay, a few for that too. That's true. It's the to string value. And that is because of the type erasure and the whole business of generics not being enforced and all the reason why we love Groovy, because you can insert anything to anywhere, 
Um, <laughs> not, not <laughs> yeah. Dirty minds, but yeah. But you can insert strings into dates, and dates into strings, and, and on any list of any type. And you also see if we print all the different classes, we won't even get conversions. It's all good to go. Everything goes. We're free spirits. You know, it's a movie, man. It's, it's all nice. So, back then, REM had a song called What's the Frequency, Kenneth? Maybe some of you remember it. Good song. What's the meta class, Kenneth? What is the meta class? Last map, I promise, no more maps. So I declare a key named the meta class, and I put my frequency in it, and now I'd like to print um, the meta class of the map with inside the string. <laughs> it would make up for interesting lyrics, I promise. So what do you say, guys? Who says a missing method? Hands up for missing method. None. Good. How about B? It'll actually print the identity of the map. Good. OK, good. C, what's the null, Kenneth? Because we won't find the value at all. Pessimistic. How about D? What's the frequency? It'll work just fine. Oh, some people didn't raise their hands. That's all the people. <laughs> no, don't cheat. Raise your hands. It depends on that. <laughs> Even if you're guessing, I mean, just you know, for me, don't break my heart here. So, what's the frequency cast? It works, and it works like a charm. <laughs> Why does it work? <laughs> it works just fine because the map field accesses are absolute. So, even if you're trying to access. Um, you know, valid get is a valid field of a map. Using this syntax, it'd be directed to the key value, you know, whole process of fetching from the map. So it's all futile. Map.class, map.metaclass, properties, all those will not work. It will always return null. And your alternative is getters. You might not remember this, but we used to use getters once. It's a long time ago, I, I know. You might not remember it. But getters are making a comeback with maps. If you want to know the meta class or the, or the class or the properties of the maps, you can use getters, and it's all great. It's all fine. The Lone Ranger. There are quite a lot of Lego images here. I really like Lego. It's not just because Denmark and all that, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sucking up to them. I really like Lego. This is interesting. I declare a range, and I iterate over the range. And for each value of the range, I do minus one and I print. Pretty simple. Or is it? <laughs> yes. I might print every line where it's decreased by one. I might print every line where it's just the normal value because it's more weird. Maybe I'll print a list of numbers. This is tricky. I like that one. Who votes for A? That's good. Who votes for B? No one. C? OK. D. How about D? D is a nice choice, isn't it? Great. So, if you voted C, you won the internet, people. Come claim the internet. Why is that? Let's take it step by step. This is actually a bit weird, but a, a common mistake many people do is actually, uh, <laughs> yes, declaring a range within a list where the range is already a list. So basically, we've declared a range within a list. Now we have a list with one uh, element, which is the range which we just declared. So if we test the size, we'll see the size is 1. And then we iterated over it with each. So we received the range itself, decreased by 1, which is like collection.remove. And now we have just a simple collection with no 1 in it. This is nice. I like that one. It's cool. OK, ready for next? Are we all OK? Are we all good? Having fun? 
I hope. This was a lot of hard work, people. <laughs> Prime cuts. I had a hard time putting in this image because I'm vegetarian, but you know, illustration and whatnot. It's still good. It's all okay. This one is a bit long, so take your time reading it. Notice that I'm taking a G-string and converting it into a double. I'm ruthless. You don't, you don't know me, okay? And the signature of the method is with def, not with a type. Do we need more time? I know, it's low. Come on. <laughs> Give me some breathing room. <laughs> right, so because it's a bit long, uh, wait, does anyone need any more time to read it or you're good? Can we continue? Excellent. Okay, so it's a bit long, so I had to put the, uh, all the possibilities on the next page, so if you need me to go back, just say so. But these are all the possibilities I give you. True. Who says it's true? You're crazy, it's four. Four isn't a prime number, it's not true. <laughs> Use your heads, people. Number format exception, because I'm doing weird stuff with G-strings and doubles and passing it into, no. No one fell for that. Missing method, good. False, because four is not a prime number. You're all smart guys, false. <laughs> but it's true. Any guesses why it's true before we continue on to the session? Sorry? Okay, no. Uh, very good. Closure. And that's why I try to return for enclosure. Not only um, does each not return a value because it's void and blah, blah, blah. I return within the closure. And returning within the closure returns the closure, not the method I'm in. Because, you know, executes in another point in time. Weird timey wimey stuff, if you're watching The Doctor. And so what happens is actually. The test is successful. The test um, works. It uh, defines four as a number which is not a prime number, and it tries to return false, but the return false is ignored because we continue iterating over all the numbers until we re reach the last statement, sorry, which is true, and we return true. The sorry? Uh, over my head. <laughs> over my head. Okay. Sorry, yes. No? Return. I think. Let's check it later. But if you, you might be right. Um, this case, it won't save you anyway. I mean, <laughs> still failed, didn't it? <laughs> it's not each's fault, don't blame it. Uh, so what can we do instead? We can, I think this is the ugly way, but we can use like the result, um, a Boolean switch, keep it state. When we iterate and find that it's not a prime number, we just break and exit, just like a normal way. I would have preferred to use it with any or every, but it's a bit long for this and it's not really relevant. But this still would be a lot more elegant using any or every, in, in my opinion. Sorry? Um, I think each breaks. It's a normal, no? My bad. So, no. Still works. <laughs> <laughs> But thanks, 
thanks for the comments. I'm not writing down the comments, so whoever is commenting things, especially you can let's talk later about comments because I'm not writing them down and I'll forget and I want to correct this. Never mind. Rock and roll. Yeah, we all like rock and roll. So the missing lyrics. We know Groovy rocks the JVM, but let's not forget how Van Halen rocked in the 80s. You remember Van Halen? They were ridiculous, weren't they? <laughs> in this case, I'd like Van Halen to sing Jump, okay? And we've got this really nice uh, feature of Groovy, catching missing method invocations, just like catching the missing property invocations. So I call println with Van Halen dot jump. I start a g-string, okay, with the uh, lyrics. And then I call a method which didn't exist, called lyrics. Called by method missing, and it will return the lyrics. Pretty straightforward. Are we good to go? Yeah, yeah, all fine, good. These are the options. Here are the lyrics. Everything worked A-OK. -okay. Who thinks it worked properly? Okay. You're not trusting me, and I don't like that. I'd, I'd like you to start trusting me. Who thinks it's here the null? Okay. Start of failure. It won't even compile. Maybe missing method exception. Okay, missing method, and you were correct. Any guesses on why it was a missing method exception? Static, very good. We try to invoke. <laughs> we try to invoke a static method. Sorry, a non-static method on a static object. Obviously, the object wasn't created yet, so no method missing method to catch it. So we get a missing method. I thought I've, sorry, fixed it, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard work copying code and highlighted to, uh, to the presentations, not easy. So I skip corners. But this is how we could have solved it. We could have used the meta class, okay? Uh, it's not as comfortable because it can't be embedded within the class itself. It has to be done on the outside. Sorry. Actually, it's possible for the, uh, the signature for the static method missing method is weird. Hmm. Okay. We'll just show it to me later. Yep. Cheers. <laughs> so, let's rock the meta class. You know, just like Van Halen did back in the 80s. Pi. Who doesn't love pi? Both the food and the number. This is actually one of my favorite puzzles. Not just because I love pi. So, place your bets, people. Is it true? Who says true? It'll value it as a double because 4.13 could be a double. Okay. Missing property because there's no such property as 14. Maybe it's a little weird. How about false? Everything went fine, but there ain't no double. Okay. Missing method? It's a good number. Anyone want to change their mind before you carry on? <laughs> Your reputation is at stake here, but no one's counting. False. Why is it false? This is actually pretty cool, so we'll take it step by step too. Um, when I assign the value of 3 to double, I get 3.0. And when I embed it in the G string, I get 3.0.14.
It might be a semantic revision of spring, but it's not double. So, you know, fonts and all that. Okay. RSVP. You know, so I know these are only Legos, but I still wish they'd attend my wedding. All these guys, you know, Doctor Who and Batman and all that. That would be cool. <laughs> so. I've got a new invitation, and I've got a field of type int with one in it. So I create an invitation, but I want to take my girlfriend along. She's tagging along, so I'll add plus one to the invitation. So, who guesses it's a missing property? Maybe because of time to the scope? Not accessible? No. Startup failure? Won't even compile. One? No incrementation done. Two? Because there's two people attending. Good. Very good. Because, <laughs> surprisingly enough, it will not even compile. Why? I'm not sure. <laughs> My guess is that it tries somehow to cast plus one. I was hoping one of the casting, yes, I thought so. Neat trick though, it's really cool, I like it. But there's still good news. You can still attend the wedding because it could work. You could either initialize the invite within the parentheses, and that's fine, or just uh, surround the whole uh, expression within parentheses. That works too. This is all good. Right. Take the power to the max. We're ramping it up here. Okay. I don't want to start like a Superman versus Batman. No. Don't start it, okay? Because Batman will take, for sure. <laughs> so, let's see. I've got a list of integers once more, except for one element, which is a string. Now I try to find the maximum value. But it's a bit of a weird max closure, because I return the item only if the value is less than 50. We all know the max function on, on collections, all good. You should have, if you've been to Mr. Hackies. <laughs> By the way, this is not a good example of writing code, okay? <laughs> <laughs> when I tell you what doesn't what does work and what doesn't work, it's not as if it's a good alternative. Don't, just don't do it. <laughs> Let's see what the options are before we continue on. We already know it's not a class cast exception. Can't be a class cast exception, can it? Maybe it's nine because nine is the lowest. Who thinks nine? Nine, anyone? Okay, that's a good number of nine. No, there's no max. You see, I can return all of everything's over. You know. How about 56? Who votes for 56? No, no, not enough people voting, guys. <laughs> Fake it. Blue screen of death. <laughs> no one. <laughs> okay. Do we need more time? Yes, okay. <laughs> It 
snell, isn't it? Snell. Okay, hands up for A. Hands up for B. C. It's obvious, isn't it? D. Very good. Who voted C? C. Who voted C? You're the man. Very good. <laughs> Why? Why is it C? This is also a bit weird. I know I'm not making it any easier. Uh, nothing weird about GUI, just weird about the code. So I evaluated 56, that's no more than 50, so I returned null. Evaluated 9, but the actual code of it is 57, because if you remember, uh, casting strings to int starts from 47, goes all the way up. And 74, also no greater than 50, so we return null. But if you remember, and if you've read the Java doc, sorry, the Groovy doc, of max properly, you know that returning a null on every iteration of the max enclosure will result in the first element of the list, regardless of the evaluation. 56 people, that's nice. So sadly, this is the last one. I really didn't have a lot of fun doing this. Okay. Yeah, it's like a what with a W-A-T. Okay. What? <laughs> Can you assign primitive values to variables? Maybe it's doing the, the whole auto-boxing, unboxing thing. Really strange. Okay, who thinks it'll fail in compilation? A, right. B, it'll print int long booleans as, uh, as seen on TV. C, it'll do the whole conversion from primitives. And or maybe it'll print only int because it won't <laughs> enter any of the if. No, good. So, it fails. Uh, any guesses on why it fails before we see the... Uh <laughs> so it fails because I try to assign a value within an if clause. Um, valid, yeah, you shouldn't be doing it anyway, so it serves you right and whatnot. But it's not completely impossible, okay, uh, because you can actually do the assignment and 
uh, wrap it in parentheses. And I personally love this not because it's a good idea or because it's wise, but because I can do it, because Groovy lets me do it. So the result of this assignment and the return from after you, you know, the assignment within the parentheses is actually the value of the assignment. So given Groovy truth, uh, the value is actually maintained. It maintains the uh, primitive int type, uh, which applies to true, so everything is A-OK. -okay. But in this, you know, we failed on the assertion of the Boolean. So, thank you very much. You all proved yourself as excellent groovy ninjas. I hope you all had as much fun as I have, because this was really great. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> One more thing. One thing. Thank you. One last thing. Uh, first off, I really would like to make this into sort of a tradition, at least keep it going, so if you've got like nice gooey puzzles, send them in, we'll send you a t-shirt. And uh, how many people here watch uh, Game of Thrones? All of you watch Game of Thrones, obviously. Yeah, so Alanis the Pays is dead, and Guillaume and Cedric, two t-shirts, limited editions, very nice stuff. They helped me out a lot with doing the puzzles, so also, you know, applause for them or whatever, or just go outside and applaud them personally. It also works. Thank you very much.